Well, welcome to Vineyard, all of those of you who are joining us on online, which is everybody, because we're not meeting in a physical space right now. Uh, we're meeting in the cloud, right? And I think if you're meeting in the cloud, doing church in the cloud, that's closer to heaven. Unless you're having connectivity issues, then I guess you might feel you're closer to something else. But I'm so glad that you're part of what we're doing here. We're in this series, Not Afraid. Today, we're going to be talking about the important topic of your part in reopening America. We're all talking about that. That's where our country is. April 16th, the White House Task Force for the Coronavirus met. There's Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks telling us how we can get involved and play our part in these phases of opening up America. Some states have already stepped into that and started going into that direction. You have Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, Texas to a certain degree. They're all starting to do some things, opening up their states. We have an important part to play, and we want to play that part. I find it fascinating that here we have shared values, probably like never before in our country, with what the country is doing and what the church, those are our values. And we get a chance to really speak into this and lead the way in a way that maybe we've never had an opportunity to before. And we want to take that opportunity. I think of this verse, it says, making the most of every opportunity, every opportunity because the days are evil. We are in difficult days and this is a huge opportunity. Let's look at those. We're going to look at the four, uh, four guidelines that have been given out by the CDC, by the Corona Task Force that we need to do. And each one of those represents a value. So we're going to look at the value, look at the guideline, and, and then take, take those steps, take that opportunity. Let's look at that. First of all, uh, we are given the opportunity to show compassion. Compassion really comes from entering into somebody's pain, somebody's difficulty. I mean, most of us aren't born with that compassion. That's something that grows in us. We're going along our merry way, and all of a sudden, boom, we get sidelined. We get put in this difficult place, and then for the first time, we can identify where, where other people are struggling with. The safety guideline, number one, is, is to practice social distancing. I put experience social distancing because we're talking about compassion. If you just practice it, you just do it, and then when it's done, you're over. Experience means you're going to go through it. You're going to identify with people that have to go into that situation. I came across this person's diary recently uh, online, and here's what she said. She goes, I used to spin the toilet paper like it was a wheel of fortune. Now I turn it like I'm cracking a safe. Talking about her social distancing, staying at home. A half, she says, half of us are going to be co come out of this quarantine amazing cooks. The other, we're going to end up having some kind of drinking problem. I need to practice social distancing from the refrigerator. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Homeschooling is going well, says this mom. Uh, two students suspended for fighting and one teacher fired for drinking on the job. And then lastly, I like this one. This morning I saw a neighbor talking to her cat. It was obvious she thought her cat understood her. I went back into my house, told my dog, and we had a good laugh. So these are some of the commiserations that we share, uh, that the difficulty of being in containment, of being at home, shelter in place. But some people, they experience that day in, day out. That is their life. That's how we can have compassion. Here's some of those people that experience that, people that are socially awkward. We call them EGR because it's extra grace required. When you're around somebody socially awkward, you know, it takes a little more grace for that person. But to put yourself in their shoes, they have it very difficult. They don't know how to have good conversations. They struggle in that area. People are, a lot of them don't have friends. People are distant. They don't invite them to parties. You know, this past week, there's been a lot of news about graduations and about a proms, people, went, girls that, and guys that weren't able to celebrate their prom, and so they would post some of those things up online, some of the things that they were trying to celebrate and make do with what they had. Listen, there's some people that they went to high school, they didn't go to prom because they knew they wouldn't fit in. They didn't get invited. They couldn't find a date. They had a mental disability. They had a physical disability, and they experienced social distancing all the time. There's introverts, people that like to be around people, but it's just draining for it's just mentally or emotionally draining for them. So they find themselves 
always alone because they're so drained. Oh, older people who used to be in the fast lane, but now because of their age, because whether they're in independent housing or in a nursing home, they have so many restrictions on their lives that they can't do a lot. They can't go out very much. People don't visit them and they have all of the pain with that. And then people with injuries or illnesses, you know, you're moving along, everything's fine. All of a sudden you get this injury and you find yourself sidelined, longing to get out of there. Most of us just fall into uh, self-commiseration and a pity party. But instead of doing that, we can think about others and have compassion. It says when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and they were helpless. I think that's a good description of a self-quarantine that goes on week after week after week. It just feels just unrelenting, harassing, and it feels like you have no, uh, no control over it. You're helpless. And there's compassion when you realize we're going to be able to get out of this. Many people live in that all the time. It says, comfort those who are frightened. There's plenty of those today. Take tender care of those who are weak and be patient with everyone. I think patience is needed probably more than anything. You know, in Jesus' day, the number one disease that people were afraid of, they thought it was more contagious than anything, was leprosy. Leprosy, people who had leprosy were forced out of the community, extreme social distancing. They were expected to carry a bell. If they came close to somebody, they were supposed to yell leper and ring their bell, and then they would be shunned. And so Jesus entered into that world, and he would go in and encourage them, touch them, pray for them, and, of course, heal them. Amazing things, showing compassion. That's certainly one of the values we have. Another one is this demonstrating self-sacrifice. There's a lot of sacrifice that we are being expected to do. It's voluntary, really, at a, at a large level, but some of it is just a sacrifice that we're doing on behalf of others. Here's some of the losses that have happened. Not our ability to travel. It's hurt our money, work, school, physical exercise, social life, recreation, vacations, our investments, our, our, our retirement funds. All those things have happened, and it's self-sacrifice. In other words, I'm giving that up for the sake of somebody else. That comes right into our second safety guideline, which is protect the most vulnerable. Protect. Now, that's a biblical value. That is, that is a battle cry for the church. We protect the most valuable. I love the story that Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan. You know that story. Uh, this Jewish businessman was, was, was traveling. He was mugged He's on the brink of death. Two other Jews go by, they ignore him. Then the Samaritan, who's not really even part of the Jewish community, he's, he's, he's considered uh, you know, repulsive. He stops and helps this guy. This is Jesus' story. A Samaritan came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion. This guy is in this situation, no fault of his own. Here he is, he's in this terrible place and, and this guy shows him compassion for him. He stooped down and gave him, notice the things that he does. It's self-sacrifice. He, he gives him his own aid. He pours olive oil on his wounds, disaffecting them with wine. Now, these are the medicines of their day. And he bandages them up to stop the bleeding, lifting them up. He placed him on his own donkey and brought him down, down to an inn. Then he took him from his donkey and carried him to a room for the night. The next morning more self-sacrifice, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words. He says, take care of this man until I come back from my journey. If it costs me more, he doesn't say charge it to him. He says, I will repay you when I return. Jesus says, you must go and do the same. Wonderful description of what it means to protect others who are vulnerable. This guy had to stop. He, he gave up his his. Uh, his safety. There could have been other muggers there uh, that would have hurt him. He certainly was inconvenienced. He had somewhere to go and he had to stop. And I mean, it totally changed the, the way his day and, and possibly day after that and the day after that, you know, went. He was inconvenienced. It affected his effort, his time, his money, certainly. And so whenever we're self-sacrificing, it is, it's a form of carrying somebody else's burden. Help carry one another's burdens, the Bible says. And in this way, you will obey the law of Christ. This is part of what we do when we are caring for others, protecting the most vulnerable. You know, COVID, is this, this SARS 
COVID-2, which is the coronavirus, is really different than so many other viruses. For example, the H1N1 uh, Spanish flu of 1918, that preyed on people that were the strongest in the society. Most of the people who died were in their 20s and 30s and early 40s, people at the top of their health, no underlining conditions, strong immunity, and it killed them by the millions. This flu is insidious. Here, it, 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 among younger, stronger people, sometimes they don't even know they have it, and they're super contagious. And the people that it hurts are the people that are the most vulnerable, in this case, are the older people, people with underlining health conditions. And so this is, takes self-sacrifice. I'm doing something, it's not for me, for the, uh, the bulk of Americans. It, it, they're probably going to be fine if they get it, but they're going through all the self-sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. Ask yourself what you would want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. What a beautiful thing. Would you want people to be willing to be inconvenienced? They can't take their vacation. They, they, maybe their kids can't go to school. They, they, their work shuts down. All kinds of things that are going on in our society. They can't get elective uh, practices, uh, elective medical procedures. They can't go to the dentist like they want to. They can't get their hair done. All the things that, in order to save your life. And if you were to answer yes, and most of us, I think, would say, yeah, if you'd be willing to do that for me, I like living. We're doing that for others. And I think it's a beautiful thing. When, and a lot of times we don't know, even know them. Unless you're a Christ follower, it says, actually, you do know them in a way. Here's what Jesus says. He says, when you did see the sick, you, and, and did we care for you? He said, then the king will say, and this is Jesus talking. He says, I will tell you the truth. Anything you did, even for the least of the people here, you did for me. In other words, when you see a sick person, when you help somebody who's in need, because you're doing it unto him. So we kind of do know the names of the priests because we're doing it for Christ. I love that value. Third value is give a daily blessing. Each day, look for an opportunity to bless other people. How can I help somebody? Wake up each day. I want to be a blessing to others. Now, there is a way we can do that, and this is the third safety guideline, which is wear a face mask in public. That's a challenge for us because that's not part of our culture. Sharon and I, a few years ago, I think four or five years ago, we went to visit some friends in Japan. And we noticed that there was a, a lot of people wearing face masks. Every day we were there, whether we were in Tokyo or Nagasaki, wherever we went, they, people, about 10% had a face mask. We asked our friends, why are they wearing a face mask? They said, because they have a sore throat. They have something that they think they might be sick. They're doing it to protect others because they're sick. See, that, I, did, I had to ask that question because in our culture, even if you're sick, you don't wear a face mask. Nobody does that. So this is a major, major learning curve for us. For so many of us, it's very difficult. We don't understand that. And so here's the, this is the uh, N95 mask. This is what the healthcare professionals use, right? This is designed to keep the virus. You're working up close near somebody. You have a high potential to be infected by them. You wear the N95 mask to keep you from being infected. But most Americans, that is not their situation. Their situation is we do it so we don't give it to others. That's why something as easy as a handkerchief, you just make this into a mask, put that on, it keeps you from giving it to somebody else. To better explain this, I want you to watch this video, watch. But now the more important thing, masks fundamentally prevent the transmission from you to others by sneezing, coughing, but also breathing. And many people are the most contagious before they start showing symptoms. So, when we both have a face mask, I protect you, you protect me, and we are both safe. So, I protect you, you protect me. And with this virus, it's not just coughing and sneezing, it's just as simple as breathing or talking with our words. It's how it's so contagious, it can, it can transfer that way. I think of this verse here, very apropos, your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. This is actually true this day right here when the coronavirus environment we're in, that our, our words can make that kind of difference. We have a men's small group that did an exercise just a few weeks ago where they decided to, those who participated, took 24 hours and didn't talk at all. No talking. That's tough to do. I've never done that. Uh, I thought it was, I thought that was impressive. And the reason they were doing that is because they really wanted to think about everything that they said 
uh, and it was a way to kind of put a restraint so that they could learn to be a blessing with their words. Here's what one of them said. He says, he goes, I partook in a soul training exercise in which I would abstain from speaking for a 24-hour period. Even though I was determined to complete this exercise, it proved to be a challenge beyond success. My true failures became apparent in how I would speak to myself. There were times when I would blurt out self-deprecating judgment such as, you big dummy, or you slob. I don't allow others to speak to me this way, but I have allowed myself to do so indiscriminately. I found through this exercise my tongue truly gives me the ability to curse or bless, to speak words of life or words of death, or more often than not, these words would almost flow involuntarily. So learning what comes out of my mouth. Another person had a different experience. He said, practicing a day of silence during the early stages of the pandemic where sore throat is a major symptom indicator can certainly freak people out. In other words, they're thinking he's not talking because he's infected. But the point of this was, hey, everything that comes out of my mouth, I want it to be a blessing. And when you come to Christ, God starts to work on what we say. He, that's one of the things that he starts to transform. And here's a rule on that. Anything that is not transformed is transmitted. That's, in other words, if we have the unredeemed part of us ends up hurting other people because of the words we speak that cause them pain. It's true with the virus, and it certainly is true uh, spiritually as well as how we talk. Look after each other so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. This is what we're talking about, is that by looking after one another, and the way, one of the ways to do that is by wearing a mask. Now, the truth is, if you go out and about, you'll see plenty of people not wearing a mask. Not wearing a mask. Why would they not wear a mask when it's so important? Well, some of the reasons is they might not have one. That's probably true more in the past than today. Another one is they don't realize that it's to protect others. They probably think it's to protect uh, themselves, and they're thinking, hey, I'm uh, a risk taker? I don't need it. No, it's, it's a way to protect others. Three, or they're just uninformed about how this virus and the method of its transmission. They think that they need to have a sore throat or a high fever or something in order to be contagious, and they don't realize that they can feel fine. And by not wearing a mask, just breathing or talking to somebody, they transmit it. And then don't, they just don't care or they don't want to be inconvenienced. It is a hassle. I think we all agree. Everybody I've talked to, they don't like wearing a mask, me included, but we're inconvenienced because we want to be a blessing to other people, whether they do it back or not. It says, abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. In other words, you don't walk around thinking, hey, they're not wearing a mask. Uh, you know, I, don't, I shouldn't have to wear a mask. I don't, you know, because why should I protect them if they're not protecting me? The Christ-like attitude where we take the lead is we protect others. We be a blessing regardless of whether people do it back. Number four is offer mutual accountability. This one's possibly the most difficult because ingrained in our culture is independence. We love our independence as Americans. I mean, we celebrate our independence. We celebrate the 4th of July. We even have the Declaration of Independence. So this idea of mutual accountability, which is interdependence, which is a biblical value, is hard for us. The value in Scripture is not independence, it's interdependence. In other words, we need one another. And out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other, of each other in love. This is what the Bible refers to as what, it's mutual accountability, but the Bible calls it being supportive of one another. We get this in the safety guideline number four, opt-in for testing and tracing. Now you'll hear more and more about this because this is a key part of opening America up again and so that we don't have a resurgence of this virus. We need to be tested. I think that's obvious, right? Most of us are okay with that. You're not feeling well, you're concerned, you think you might have been exposed, you need to be tested. And, we're, and, we're, and obviously that's been talked about a lot. Testing also is this testing for immunity. You know, you've already had the virus and you want to be tested to see if you have the antibodies, maybe even give a, a, a blood donation. And that's great. And doctors are saying people on both ends of those, no problem. They're willing to be tested. They're willing for antibodies to be tested. But here's the challenge is contact tracing. This is vital so that we don't end up back where we were or even worse, Sometimes people aren't sure what contact tracing is. Here it is, contact tracing. Contacting, pe it's contacting people infected with COVID-19 
and then finding everyone they have been around for the last 14 days, that's a long time, two weeks back, and asking them to self-quarantine for 14 days from their last contact with the infected person. So that's a big ask. Not only do people have to be willing to say, yes, I'm going to share my whole life history for the last 14 days, but any of those people that were near you, in other words, they were in your presence for 10 minutes, six feet or or, or closer, you know, kind of a little combination there. You have to self-quarantine for 14 more days, even after this, all of this ordeal we've gone through together. So how do you do contact tracing? Well, there's three primary ways. One is the self-reporting. This is difficult because this virus can spread. You sit at a restaurant. They've already demonstrated. They've seen cases where somebody sits at a restaurant. They don't even know they're infected. They affect several people at their table and tables nearby beyond six feet. Because if you're there, the longer you are, the more that circulates uh, throughout the air. So that's very difficult to do, self-reporting, but certainly that's one of them. Then the government's going to look at hiring hundreds of thousands of investigators, going and talking to people. And uh, this is the old way that they've done it over the years. Just going and it's very, very laborsome, very trying to hunt down every single person and talk to them about who they've been near and, and, and then interview and then finding all the people they've been near. Very, very difficult. What they're hoping to do is use smartphones. Smartphones, the new technology that uh, so many of us are used to technology, whether it's uh, some kind of device in our home that, has, that helps us, you know, with cooking things or, or, you know, we use our phones for all kinds of things. Certainly GPS which tracks us in all kinds of ways. That information is sold to uh, advertisers and all kinds of things, at least in our country, right? But they're wanting to do something that's less invasive, but still may be very difficult for a lot of people. The smartphone tracing technology, both Apple and Google have joined up, which is like almost never, right? They're both doing this. They're putting it into their operating system. So in a few weeks, you'll be asked to uh, download and install the new operating system. This will have it automatically in it. It's gonna use Bluetooth, which is different than GPS. Bluetooth is very localized. It's gonna have uh, cryptology with it that will change hourly, might even change, uh, there's, that's still a discussion, it might even change every 10, 15 minutes to make sure that you're safe. It alerts you uh, the time and place that you would cross paths with an affected person. So now you're aware of that. And, uh, and then it also has an expiration date. In other words, when this blows over, both Apple and Google are in their next operating system will remove that feature because most people don't want that on there. We're doing this because it's a global pandemic. This is our civic duty, but it's more than that because people's lives are on the line, because our whole economy all over the world is decimated. This is something we can do to help save lives and help people. Uh, all around in, in many, many ways. And so uh, I think it's a, it's a great value that we can lead in. Build up hope so that all t- we're all together in this. No one is left out. No one is left behind. This is a great description of what we're going to be needing to step into with testing, with contact tracing. So important. You know, contact tracing really has a spiritual parallel. In our church, we want to make sure and help people. We, there's some people that are discouraged or in a place that are difficult and we don't even know it. And we want to figure out how can we help people? How can we get out to them, uh, whether they share that or not, whether they're aware of it or not? And we do that primarily through small groups. Small groups is our way that we do spiritual contact tracing. And we say we do connect, protect, grow. In other words, relationally, we connect out to them. We're doing phone calling. Hopefully everybody who's listening to this, if you're part of our church, you've received several phone calls, several text messages. How are you doing? We, we're, we care. We're praying for you. And we want to help you to grow in Christ, help you to grow in your disciplines. It's so important. The Bible says in every relationship, each of you must wrap around yourself the apron of a humble servant. This is really what we're talking about, right? Wrapping around this humble servant attitude of saying, I care about other people. And because of that, I'm going to grow in compassion. I'm not going to just long for the time that it's all over. I'm going to grow in compassion, understand where other people are at. I want to be willing to uh, give up and be uh, self-sacrificial because it, I want to help other people. I want to look for a way to bless people every day with my words and currently it's with a mask. And I certainly want to be mutually accountable. I understand the value that we're all in this together. And the way we can 
participate is in one, two, or even all three of these ways of contact tracing as well as the testing. Last verse, those of us who are strong and able, so there's, there's plenty of us in this country, we're strong and able. Here's what's the word for them. In the faith, need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter. In other words, there's plenty of people that aren't strong and able, people that are more vulnerable, less able to help themselves. He says, and not just to do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service. That's, what it, that's the Christian value. Strength. It's not to show off on how great I am. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That's my prayer. That's what I want us to do in, 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 in today and throughout this whole endeavor with the coronavirus. How can I help? And there's practical ways, practical ways that you and I can help. Demonstrating compassion, which means practicing and experiencing social distancing. It means being willing to, uh, to go without, to experience some of the things with a, with, a, with a joyful attitude, knowing because I'm protecting people that are most vulnerable. It means being a blessing to others. And that does mean wearing a mask, not necessarily a high-end N95 mask. Anything will do, but it's a way of blessing people, whether they know it or not. And in most cases, they probably won't know it, right? Because that's not part of our culture. And then lastly is mutual accountability. We're interdependent. And so we can help one another, support one another through testing, through contact tracing. And my prayer is that let's step in. This is our game. We, as Christ followers, ha- have these values for as the forefront and have for 2,000 plus years. This is our day. This is our opportunity to do something great for people around us. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Bless you. Lord, we just want to come alongside and do what you're doing right now. You haven't forsaken us. You haven't forgotten about, forgotten us. Lord, I pray for those who are in a difficult place, whether they've lost their employment or they're affected in some way uh, with somebody who is, has the virus or they know somebody who has. They're worried, they're concerned about schooling or uh, something with their own health or they struggle with anxiety. Father, I just pray for your blessing, your power, your presence to just flow into their home, into their heart. Lord, I pray for those who feel far from you. If that's you, you're saying, you know, I don't feel that close to God. Why not come home? Why not take this moment right here, right now and say yes to Christ? Say, yes, Lord, I want want you in my life. I want to follow you. I want these values to come naturally to me because you're inside me. Your your Holy Spirit is doing it, and it's not up to my own effort. And if that's you, I would like you to pray with me right where you're at. Just say, dear God, in your heart, there might be people in your home. You might be alone. It doesn't matter. Just say, God, dear God, I want to follow Christ today. I want to know in my soul that I'm right with you. So forgive me. Say, God, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for trying to do this life on my own. Trying to create my own plan, my own dreams. Lord, I want to surrender all that to you. You do your work in my life. See, I want to follow you with your help. And I want to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our Vineyard Church stream. If you prayed that prayer with Pastor Andy, we want to hear about it. We want to support you. We believe that it's the best decision that you can make. If you're on the Church Online platform, click that button that says, I committed my life. And that will take you to a connect card option where we will be able to send you information and support this new decision. If you're on Facebook, let us know in the chat or send us a private message. We would like to send you the same information. Hey, if you call Vineyard Church your home, you can actually give online right at our website, vineyardchurch.com, or you can text. You can text 45777 VCC plus the amount and give right there on your phone. We have been doing so much in our community just because the building is closed doesn't mean that we're not reaching out with our food pantry, financial resources, and giving people food gift cards so they can eat during this season. If you'd like to support that, just click the COVID-19 option. And hey, we also want to pray for you. 
If you have prayer requests or praise reports, send those in. We know it's a crazy time. We want to support you spiritually. You can send those to vccprayers at gmail.com or right there on our website, vineyardchurch.com. Just click prayer. If you're on the church online platform, you can actually get live prayer right now by clicking the prayer button. You'll immediately be connected with one of our prayer team members who'd love to pray for you right now. Stay connected with us on social media. You can follow us at Vineyard VA on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But hey, we're doing this next week. We'll see you right here on this platform next week. Invite somebody out. We'll see you then.